as I get older, I realize some of the most important things in life we weren't taught as kids. We weren't taught. Why aren't we taught about taxes and LLCs and corporations in high school? Right? Like, why aren't we? That's a great point, bro. That you know, if you want to change your marriage, you got to change the man that shows up to the marriage. And and if you know, primarily we think that relationship problems are a problem in the relationship. And so we go to marriage counseling, or we read a book on marriage, or you know, we go to a marriage retreat. When in reality, the problem is not a problem in our marriage. It manifests mm -hmm. in our marriage, or the marriage problems are a byproduct of the real problem, which is always a deeper issue inside of us. That Today, I am joined by the legendary Tim Arrigo. Tim, how are you today? Good, brother. How are you doing? So good, man. I've followed your TikTok for about a year. And last week, I couldn't find your TikTok videos. They were gone. And then I jump over to Instagram to see if you're on Instagram, and you are. And there you are in your backyard with a glorious message about your vision and your mission. And uh, if it's okay, I want to splice part of that in to this video real quick. How do you react to potential pitfalls? My TikTok just got taken down at 720,000 followers. And you know what? I'm not even phased. I love the fact that when everything appeared to be falling apart, you were unfazed. Yeah. Well, you have two choices really, right? Let it destroy you. And at the end of the day, it's like, where, where are we really putting our faith? You right. know, are we putting our faith in the followers or in, and you know, the platforms, or are we putting our faith in, in the calling and the anointing that's on us? Right. You know, and, and the fact that, you know, even if everything collapsed and fell apart, I would, where else am I going to go? What else am I going to do? Right. You know, and for me, it's, um, I'm going to continue to be of service and I'm going to continue to help people and, and nothing's going to ever prevent me from, from living that way. Right. Right. And that was, it was very cool that even in, in the face of potentially, depending on how your funnels are set up, potentially losing a lot of income, you're just like, Hey, it's going to work out. And it did work out. It was reinstated a few days later, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, somebody from my team, we have a VA and he, uh, he said, Hey, do you want to, do you want me to get the TikTok back? And I said, uh, yeah, I tried already, but yeah. go ahead, give it a try. And then he's like, Hey, message me a day later. Hey, we got the account back. What? And I was like, what did you do? He said, I just sent an appeal. I said, I sent an appeal and they rejected it. He said, well, uh, I, I don't know. It must've been what I wrote. Well, so I was like, pays to have a good team. Yeah. We got a great VAs. Uh, he's out in the Philippines. His name's Russell and he did, he got it back. So legendary yeah. legendary i'm so interested in your background and how you arrived in this place as not just a men's coach but a men's relationship coach yeah more specifically what was high school like for you horrible oh uh, no okay terrible. yeah high school was a terrible time for me my parents were in the middle of a divorce hmm. um there was a lot of trauma going on inside my house uh, my dad my when my mom and dad split my dad kind of was licking his wounds, kind of going through his own pain. And my mom was feeling a lot of guilt because of the divorce and she took it out on herself. Mm. Um, my brother was pretty much MIA. He was checked out by that point. Him and I really didn't have a good relationship growing up. And I had gone to three different high schools. So I went to a private Catholic school, um, pretty much had no friends. Right. Like I was never, you know, like Mr. Popular, you know, so to speak, but I always have my group of friends, right? I hung out with the skaters and, you know, the, the guys that played music and, and at private Catholic school, you know, I, I wasn't a jock and I wasn't a nerd. So I didn't really have any friends. And that was during a time where I, I had already been kind of dabbling in substance use. Right. And that was at a time where pretty much substances became my main form of coping. And uh, after that first year at Catholic school, I went to public school and just never went to class and then got kicked out of public school and went to a continuation school um, down in San Juan Capistrano, which at the time uh, was you were in we were in the hood. We were like right across the street from uh, Lazanha, which is like an old neighborhood down there. Okay. And, um, it was the first high school ever built in Orange County. Whoa. Uh, ever built in Orange County. So it's right next to the San Juan mission, which was built in the 1700s. Yeah. Okay. I'm familiar. And uh, yeah, it's right next to that. 
It was an old uh, high school. Um, there was so much asbestos in the ceilings and stuff that they couldn't do any remodels on it. So it was, it was very, it looked very similar to how it looked uh, back in the day. Whoa. And we went to school there, you know, five, six hours a day. And that was actually a good place for me. But unfortunately, if you take every quote unquote bad kid from every surrounding school district and you put them in one school, uh, pretty much a recipe for disaster. Sure. So um, I pretty much had, you know, free reign. I had no supervision and had no guidance. And I went from wearing, you know, a, a private, you know, private school uniform, you know, um, Sue Mills pants to uh, like having a pen Pendleton buttoned up to the top uh, with like a joint hanging out of my mouth, walking through the back of school, like about a year later. So uh, things happen quickly, abruptly, and high school wasn't a good time for me. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't a good time. It went by quick. I ended up kind of cheating my way through that last year and I graduated at 17. I only really did three years of high school. Wow. Wow. So what'd you do after high school? You're 17 uh, college diploma or high school diploma. What happened next? Floated around. I pretty much, uh, I didn't do anything. Um, I, I had like odd jobs here and there, but I had, I had learned, um, from some older guys that I grew up around. I kind of learned like how to hustle and how to make money. True. And that was pretty much how I pretty much what I did for the next years mm -hmm. was just partied. I right. just partied, ran the streets, and partied more. What happened between that hustling, making some money, and starting Beyond Driven? Heroin addiction. Oh, okay. Heroin addiction, hepatitis C, mm. um, homelessness, really? living in cells, overdoses, living in my car, swatting cockroaches off me in abandoned buildings. Wow. Uh, like pretty much the lowest you could ever go as a human being. Wow. Like straight, full on, like makes me emotional even talking about it, like yeah. uh, waking up with a needle in my neck in a Starbucks bathroom. Oh. Like waking up in the morning sick, going to get heroin, going to a local Starbucks or some public restroom, getting high, and then figuring out how I'm going to survive for the rest of the day and that all spawned out of um i had a meth induced psychosis at 17 after i graduated high school i had this meth induced psychosis where i went fully psychotic and uh i got my act together kind of like 18 19 i started getting my stuff together and uh i was an avid avid surfer and skateboarder and growing up that way and lived in laguna beach for a lot of years and I was down at the beach surfing in Laguna and I blew my knee out, um, blew my ACL out. And at the time uh, they gave me Oxycontin and I was like the poster boy for the Oxycontin epidemic. Right. So I got addicted to Oxycontin, which if anybody's ever tried those, they know how incredibly addictive they are. Mm -hmm. I got addicted to those. And that's what took me to the heroin use because I learned that kind of from the hustling from earlier that I could sell those pills and make a lot of money. Right. And supply my, you know, and somebody basically said, Hey man, you know, you can take one of those pills, sell it for 40 bucks and you could just get on heroin and you don't have to use these pills and you'd make a lot more money. And, and I didn't know, like, you know, back in the day, you know, for me, like when you, if you used heroin, if you crossed that line, like only convicts and like certain people did that. Like, so, right. and I always was the guy like, I'll never put a needle in my arm. I'll never um, do heroin. And, and next thing you know, man, I was I was strung out and I was just angry. Like I was just angry at the world, man. I was in so much pain that I was just angry at everything and everyone, including myself. And it was almost, I felt like my whole, the whole time was like, I was just, I was like a cry. It was a constant cry for help, dude. Like I'm dying and I'm so angry at everybody. Like I want help, but I, but I, I'm not accepting help. Right. Uh, I'm hurting everybody around me. I'm hurting my family. Um, I'm burning bridges left and right. Mm. And then it just got to the point where I just, I knew that it would be better off if I just kind of went ghost and just disappeared. And um, that was pretty much when I just kind of started to disappear for a what? month at a time. Fast. So you would just like cut off contact with any friends or family and just yeah travel or just yeah. hide out? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, wow. because when you're addicted, you know, when you're addicted to hard drugs, it's the narrowing, it's the narrowing of your focus on one goal, right? Sure. So it's no longer about, you know, my promotion and college and my family and, you know, what I'm, where I'm going on vacation or the next business. It's you're all you're thinking about is like surviving because if you don't it drugs, the hard drugs and, you know, even alcohol, they play on your brain's reward system on, on your limbic right. system. And so actually that part of your brain after a while, because, you know, your brain is always undergoing homeostasis, it kind of adjusts to the drug use. And so it, it actually, it, it, that part of your brain assumes that the drug use is necessary for survival. And then on oh, top, okay. you know, yeah. you get incredibly sick. So, you know, you're pretty much constantly just in a state of survival. Mm. And, um, uh, and then of course, like the violence and the crime and the underworld that comes with all that, which PTSD comes with that, you know, chronic anxiety comes with that because if you live that life, like you're not going to come out unscathed, right? You know, like you're going to come out with some, with some stuff that you got to deal with and the drugs are never the problem. Right. And it, it's always just a way that we solve a problem. I mean, drug, drug, drugs don't cause drug addiction, you know, sure. Just like, I get, yeah. You know, pack of cards doesn't cause gambling addiction. Sure. You know, food doesn't cause food addiction. You know, so the reality is not about it's not about why the addiction. It's about why the pain. Like, not what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. Like, what's going on with you on the inside, right? That causes you to have this type of relationship with yourself, right? Right, where you abuse yourself and neglect and abandon and betray yourself. Like, why? What is this about? Right. Um. And I think it was just for me, it was about a lot of pain and a lot of self-hatred and no direction and no guidance and knowing I had gifts, but not knowing how to tap into them. Right. Well, the version of Tim that you're describing, and, and I've seen a photo that you put on Instagram of this version of Tim and the version of Tim that we know today are completely different people. Yeah. What was the moment where, or was there a moment or were there many moments yeah. where oh, yeah. you decided to moment. make a pivot? There was a moment. Yeah, there was a moment. Yeah, there was a moment. Um, so all my friends, pretty much like all the guys I hung out with and grew up with all died or went to prison. Oh. And I had uh, a good friend of mine. who was a mentor of mine. He was like a father figure to me. He was like an older brother. And he died right in front of me. And um, he had hepatitis C and he uh, his liver was failing. And we became like inseparable during that time. Mm -hmm. And I was there at the hospital when he took his last breath. And then I kind of after that, I decided, you know, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do hard, like, I'm not going to you know, inject hard drugs, I'm just going to kind of get on methadone and kind of be on cruise control. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I found out that I had hepatitis C. And, um, and the doctors, I came in, are you sitting down? Um, I'm like, should I be I did some routine labs? And he's like, you sitting down? I'm like, should I be he's like, yeah. Um, you got hepatitis C dude and your viral load is like through the roof. It's in the millions and you're based on your genotype and the way your liver enzymes look right now. Like you gotta, we gotta treat this right away. So of course I kind of had seen my best friend just die from it. Right. And so I kind of felt like it was a death sentence, you know? Sure. And, um, I went to the doctor to try to tell him, Hey, you know, I want to get off these, you know, these drugs. And he was like, he, well, we're not doing that. Like, I want to get off these pills. You know, I want to get off the methadone and I want to get off the Xanax. And he was like, oh, we're not doing that. And um, I had this white light moment in my, in my room where I realized uh, I heard a voice and spoke to me. And it said, uh, this whole time you thought you were in control, but really you're just a slave. And um, I got really anxious and I almost had a panic attack. And I wanted to get off everything because I realized I had been basically high for 14 years nonstop. Wow. And I went to the hospital to try to detox and they were like, Oh, you're, you're doing interferon, which if anybody doesn't know, interferon is like chemotherapy. Okay. So I started doing the interferon for the hepatitis C and uh, they wouldn't detox me on the interferon because interferon is really, really brutal. Uh, it's just like chemo. It's brutal. Oh, wow. Um, the side effects are almost intolerable. Really? Uh, a lot of people will commit suicide on it. A lot, most people don't finish the treatment. You have to do it for 48 weeks. Oh, um, and uh, they've come out with much more humane ways of treating it now. Okay. Uh, but back then, interferon was the only option. Right. And um, they rejected me and they said, we can't detox you. 
but I'd already made my mind up that I wanted to. So, um, a guy followed me outside. His name is Chris. And he goes, Hey man, you know, we can't help you, but this guy can. And he gave me the a sticky note to a doctor. I went and saw the doctor. He gave me like a grassroots, you know, like prescription, you know, detox pack. I went home and I, I detoxed. And on the third day of my detox, no sleep, no food, completely disoriented muscle aches, literally going in the shower and just punching my legs until they would stop like being restless. Oh. And um, I would just turn on the shower as hot as it could go and put my legs in there and just punch my legs until they would just stop. I would stop kicking my legs. What did he give and you? Just some phenobarbital, uh, phenobarbital, suboxin, uh, oh, okay, tegretol, and um, he gave me like some methocarbamol, like some other muscle relaxers. Okay. And um, so I took this stuff for a couple of days, but it really wasn't really helping. And on the third day, I put my hands in the air and I put my face on the ground in a prone position. I put my hands in the air and I said, Jesus, if you're really real, I said, if you're really real, you can have my life. I said, you can kill me right now. You can have me. You can do whatever you want. End my life. I'm done. I said, you can kill me if you want. You can take my life. I said, do whatever you want to do with me. I'll serve you for the rest of my life if you're really real. And uh, that was the day my life changed. And about really? 30 days later, yeah. About 30 days later, I started working in uh, substance abuse and mental health. And I quickly realized that I had a gift uh, very quickly. I realized that everybody else, I kind of looking around thinking like, does everybody else feel and think the way that I do about these people? And I really realized that not to speak negatively about anybody in that environment, but a lot of people are just there because they're working. Right. And um, and people don't know, like I, I try to explain this to people like, if you don't work in those facilities, then you would never understand what it's like to work in those facilities because you're taking people from all across the country in the worst possible condition and you're putting them in one house. Okay. Right. And, you know, being around those environments, um, I could relate, you know, and I, I could connect with people and I could see stuff and I could feel stuff. And I've always been a very sensitive person. Like I'm very mm -hmm. sensitive. I feel people's energy. Like I can just, I just, I have the innate ability to just, I'm highly empathic. So I can just, I can see and feel stuff with people. I can sure. see what's going on with them. And I realized that it, it was a liability for a lot of years of my life. Like it was something I hated about myself. Like I just wanted to turn this off. I can stand it. And then I realized it was a gift in that environment. Like and um, I just started helping people and I started finding my purpose and I started working my way from, you know, graveyard shift to the morning shift, to the swing shift, to the shift lead, to case management, to, you know, lead tech, to program manager, to program director. And then all of a sudden I was like running programs, building That's programs. Sweet. Um and that was basically my ascent over a decade. I went over a over 10 years working in that industry. And um, I learned a ton. I worked with some of the top, you know, people as far as, you know, psychologists, psychiatrists, licensed marriage and family therapists, you know, LPCs, um, licensed professional counselors. So I worked, you know, I worked in the industry, went back to school, got my credentials. Um, and um, I started working, you know, doing facilitating groups and um, doing family counseling and um, I was, you know, and then, you know, I ended up getting a, a men's ministry director position at my church nice. and then just kind of was always just kind of my life just became helping people. And right. um, I just kind of realized how God had kind of orchestrated the whole thing from the very beginning. Right. Um, and that's kind of where I ended up uh, creating Beyond Driven. Wow. Wow. So from working in the ministry and the, um, and the facility at some point you're like, okay, I can take the show on the road and, and help people nationally, if not globally and create a program. Yes. Um, why the focus? And I'm thankful that you have this focus, but what made you want to focus primarily on, on relationships for men? Um, primarily a couple of reasons. Um, it's funny, you know, I, I try to tell people, it's kind of like when it's it's really hard to explain, but like when you work in the industry as long as I have and you've right. you've been around people that much and you see the same thing over and over and you see people from all different walks of life, you start to see the pathology. 
And it's almost like that part in the matrix where, you know, Neo, he gets shot in the hallway and then he stops the bullets and then he says no. And then he, all of a sudden they go, he's the one. And then it shows that he can see the code. Remember that? Oh, part? Yeah. He sees yeah. all the code. It's almost kind of like you see coding in everything and you're kind of like, oh, so it's all the same problems. Right. Like it just manifests differently. Like the guy who's homeless on the park bench injecting heroin has the same issues deep down internally. Sure. That the CEO who makes a quarter million dollars a year, who, you know, drives a, a Tesla to work every day and is struggling in his marriage. Right. Um, it's that certain people are I I personally like to go really deep with my clients. Like I like to take them into those deep places um, to do that work because I believe that without doing that work that you're not really solving the problem. Right. And for me, it was about finding an audience and about finding the right people to be able to do that with because people who are newly um, freshly recovered or, or sober, they're not you know, cognitively in a position, their brain is still healing. They're not cognitively in a position to do some of that deeper work. So it kind of naturally evolved through the ministry to helping with helping with men. And I had already worked with many, many women over the years, right? I already helped thousands of women, thousands of men. So it kind of naturally evolved into mm -hmm. that. Um, and it kind of naturally also a lot of what, how I grew up and a lot of my own personal experience, I had, you know, a previous marriage that was super toxic and unhealthy. Mm. Um, I had a trauma bonded relationship after that with a, a girl who was my fiance at the time that didn't work out. And so it kind of naturally evolved. And what I realized it's all universal, all the same stuff applies, right? right? The same core principles apply, the same stuff applies because it all comes from the same place inside of us. And that's been always what I tell guys about their marriages is, you know, if you want to change your marriage, you got to change the man that shows up to the marriage. And, and if, you know, primarily we think that relationship problems are a problem in the relationship. And so we go to marriage counseling or we read a book on marriage or, you know, we go to a marriage retreat when in reality, the problem is not a problem in our marriage. It manifests mm -hmm. in our marriage or the marriage problems are a byproduct of the real problem, which is always a deeper issue inside of us that a lot of times 99% of the time, what I've discovered and what my team has also realized is that the problems predate the marriage. The problems existed mm -hmm. prior to the marriage. So the problems pre-exist and we bring those into the marriage. And then all of a sudden we project them in the marriage. We, we get triggered, they get triggered in the marriage. And so a lot of these pain points, a lot of these wounds, a lot of these issues uh, our attachment style, the way we show up, the way our childhood has, has formed and influenced us all affect the way we do marriages and relationships because that's where our deepest needs are met right is in right. relationships so right that's kind of how it evolved fascinating yeah i uh i so so you know my expertise is very different from yours i'm i'm an expert in youtube thumbnails and youtube kid and family channels like i'm really good at that stuff so i can spot the patterns and the issues uh and things holding people back from success in in your experience with men what are there common things you see men do to ruin their relationships or? Oh yeah. 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 Oh, well, I think as men is we, uh, we all grow up with performance-based love, first of all, <laughs> you know, that's all we know, which right. is like, love is something uh, we don't know unconditional love. So love is something I got to earn. Right. It's something I got to work for. And it's something I got to prove I deserve. And, you know, um, as men, commonly, we, we struggle with feelings of inadequacy, you know, feeling like I'm not enough. And that bar can never be, I'm never at the level of the bar. The bar is always raised just out of reach. Right. And I think for men, I think that we put a lot of emphasis on our performance to feel loved. And so that's why we traditionally focus entirely on being the provider and maybe not being maybe available in other ways, whether it be sure. emotionally or even sometimes physically. So, um, that's the, the the primary thing. The cornerstone a lot of times is the way that we give and receive love. And it's not that we don't know how to give love. Sometimes it's that we don't know how to receive it. We don't even know what it looks like. You know, we don't know how to receive compliments. We, and we are always kind of, we're taught in society to kind of just man up and close off and wall off and shell off and don't show anybody anything. And, um, and I think that a lot in society, you know, reinforces this. 
And unfortunately, there's a lot of people who aren't trained and aren't experienced that tell people, you know, you need to man up, you need to do this, you need to do that. When in reality, you can't, you can't put the cart before the horse. You know, you can't decorate something that's destroyed. You know, like you, you need to go inside first and do that work first. And then the byproduct of that is right. The strength and the, um, the fortitude and the resilience and the determination that comes from that, but you got to go to the darkness first. And there's a lot of light in there. So I think the first thing is, um, is that there's always, you know, what I call, and I don't even like using this word, but it, it is what it is. It's trauma. You know, it's, 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 there are things that have occurred in our life that have shaped the way that we view ourselves and the way that we view other people, right. um, starting with our attachment style, you know, how, how our caregivers responded to our emotional needs. And then also our belief systems around that, right. Our belief systems around the world relationships ourselves. Um, so I think, I think a majority of it, um, it, it begins there. And then also, and in, in, in addition to that, the way guys traditionally, um sabotage the marriage is because they don't look inside themselves mm. they they don't have the ability to understand other people so it's like it's almost like a a, a, a sabotaging behavior of because i don't look inside because i don't want to be self-aware because that was something i was taught not to do right that there was no benefit to doing that that it would make me weak or it was pointless that's actually backfired. It helped me in business. It's helped me in certain areas of my life, but it's backfired in the sense that because I don't look inside and introspect, I don't actually know how to navigate my internal landscape. And so because of that, when I see people struggling with things, I don't, I see it at face value. I see it for, for what it appears to be instead of what it actually is. So like, you know, if my wife is struggling with something, well, I'm just seeing it as what it appears to be on the surface. I'm not actually seeing it as what it actually is which is a manifestation of stuff that's going on with her. Right. And so what I'm doing is I'm speaking to the surface and I'm getting in an argument about the surface instead of recognizing that, hey, no, this might actually be connected to something else. And I don't need to take this personal because it's not about me, right? It, it's yeah, actually yeah. about her. And right. that that completely inhibits our ability to be compassionate and empathetic, which are two things that are necessary for a healthy relationship. So because guys don't look inside, they have, they don't have the emotional intelligence. They don't have the self-awareness. Um, they don't have the ability to self-inquire and to mm -hmm. self-reflect. And because they don't do that, there's almost like this blind spot where they're just thinking, oh, it's a marital problem or it's a problem with my wife. It's like, no, no, no. It's a, it's, it's basically like you're looking at the night sky and you just see stars, Right. Right. But when you actually start to do this work, you know, what ends up happening is it's kind of like going to school for astrology and astronomy. You come back in that same hilltop, you look at that same sky, you see those same stars, but you see something different. Right. And now what you're seeing is you're like, oh, wow, you know, there's these constellations, there's Aquarius, Sagittarius, Gemini. Oh, wow, I can see what's actually going on here now. I didn't see any of this before. It's like walking through a forest, you know, and then just you're just seeing trees and then you go in with a botanist and he's like hey these are you know these are these kinds of trees and this this kind of moss and then all of a sudden you're walking through and now you can have distinctions now you can make mm -hmm. distinctions about what happened and i think the problem is men traditionally were far less emotionally intelligent than women and i think that we can't make those distinctions and without the ability to make the distinctions we just kind of can't solve the problem and then it's like, if I can't solve the problem because I'm jabbing a round peg through a square hole, then the natural thing we a lot of times do is just get frustrated and just say F it and just walk away because I'm thinking that it can't be solved. Right. Right. You just touched on so many things that are super relevant in my life. It's pretty common, you know, in, in, in the, what I've seen, you know, a lot of, a lot of the guys that we work with. Uh, they crush it in business. Mm. But the problem is, is that they, you know, here's the thing about work too, you know, work, dopamine release is, is a lot of times subjective. Like if I think that getting a Bugatti is like the greatest thing on the planet, like when I get the Bugatti, I'm going to get a gnarly dopamine release. 
Yeah. You know, like if, if I think it's the stupidest thing in the world, or if I think a pair of Nike Air Force Ones or, you know, I'm, I don't want those shoes. If I get them, it doesn't do anything to me. Whereas somebody else, you know, the collector, they collect Nikes. They're going to think it's the most amazing thing or you get this incredibly, you know, euphoric feeling when they buy the shoe. So a lot of times we don't realize that we get addicted to work, you yeah. know, and work addiction is the number one addiction that we can have where everybody in our life gives us a you know, thumbs up and we're a success. Right. And uh, but the consequences, they might not be observable with the human eye. But what's the difference, you know, between, you know, somebody who's, you know, injecting street drugs and somebody that, you know, spends a ton of money in Las Vegas when he should be paying child support or, you know, a guy that, you know, spends every last dollar he has when he should, you know, goes on vacation or he engages in pornography and neglects his family. It's like it's all the same. It's, you know, it's all the same. And, and what we see is that the consequences are the same as well right? Your family suffers and there's a spectrum of addictions, right? The addiction spectrum is, is large. Mm -hmm. And the severe end of the spectrum is somebody that uses IV drugs. It's very observable with the human eye. The consequence is very natural. Mm -hmm. And on the low end of the spectrum is maybe somebody that's, you know, chronically addicted to work and neglects their children and is emotionally unavailable as a father. Mm -hmm. So I just think that, um, you know, I think a lot of times we we tend to overemphasize like, Oh, I'm a success. I'm a success. I'm a success. And, you know, but I can't say I'm a success if, if certain areas of my life aren't successful. Right. You know, I might be a success in one area, but I think that traditionally we put such so much emphasis on providing, which is absolutely necessary is absolutely that's, that's our obligation. That's our duty as men. But there needs to, we, we don't just, we shouldn't just be, you know, father, the provider, you know, we should also, or father, the disciplinarian, you know, or father, you know, the audience, you know, Hey, go tell your dad what you did today at school. It's like, we sit there and listen. Oh, wow. Great. It's like, that's a lot of times our role. We should also be father, the nurturer, you know, father, the mentor and the teacher. And we are able to, you know, that's why I try to teach all my guys is being multidimensional. Right, like you should be capable of immense violence. If someone attacks you or attacks your family, you should be capable of defending yourself, and you you should you're required to engage in violence. There, if a lunatic attacks you and your family, you should be able to defend them. But also, like you know, if your wife is feeling emotional and you know she's struggling with something, it requires compassion from you. Hmm. You know, some moments require discipline from you. You know, it's you, you wake up early, you don't feel like hitting the gym, you know, it's like some moments require you to, you know, downshift and be more calm and more composed. Some moments require assertiveness and you'd be more direct. But I think a lot of times we take on this one dimensional version of ourselves where we mm-hmm. try to use that same power through mentality we use in our world of business, in our marriage and family life. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we crush it in business, but we feel crushed inside our home. Right. And and then all of a sudden it's like, I'm not getting what I want. You know, it's like, I'm providing, I'm providing. Why am I not getting or receiving what I want? Why? And, and as men, a lot of times that comes in the form of respect, admiration, and validation. Like we right. want to be respected. We want to be held in high regard. We want to be valued and we want to be appreciated. And right. in the absence of those things, we feel like what we're doing is a waste. And what we're not seeing is the blind spot of, Hey, dude, it's not about you providing. You're crushing it there. People just want you. They just mm-hmm. want you, bro. They just, they don't, they want you in your flip flops, you know, with, with a white t shirt on, with your board shorts on, going down to the beach. Right. And just like, you know, uh, playing music in the car, you know, playing red hot chili peppers on the stereo and just cruising. Like mm-hmm. they don't always want you in that, that, you know, work mode, problem solving mode, give advice mode. You know, I grew up with that. It was like everything was a lecture. Everything was a conversation. Everything was, you know, what I should have done or, you know, what I need to do. It wasn't ever like, you know, hey, teach you something like mm-hmm. let's, let's sit and be present or tell you, hey, you know what? I have felt like that and I've done that before and that's totally normal and it's all good. Right. Like, and, and I think that the more and again, this goes back to our introspection, our ability to acknowledge fallibility. Like I'm not a perfect man. I'm not Jesus Christ. I don't walk on water. Like I'm a fallible human being and that's okay. And that's why a lot of times as men, you know, what we lack is self-forgiveness and compassion. We, we don't have that. We don't have the ability to have compassion. What we have is a self-criticism, which is necessary at times because we need to call ourselves out. Right. But there needs to also be that equilibrium of, 
yeah, there's self-criticism and yeah, I'm stern with myself and yeah, I hold myself accountable and yeah, I have boundaries with myself, but I also have compassion for myself. I also give myself room, right? Like my back isn't up against the wall and I'm not creating self-induced stress and I'm not there. There's a way to do my life. And I'm realizing that I'm just burning out living it this way. And, and so, uh, you know, I just think it's important for us to be multidimensional in that regard because it, uh, you know, our kids, our kids don't want the version of us that shows up at work. Our wife doesn't want that version of us that shows up for our employees. Right. You know, like they want the real you, the authentic you, unadulterated, calm, laughing, you know, present, available, and uh, not always in that problem solving, lecturing, let me teach you something, I know what to do, um, almost kind of like borderline contemptuous, sure. right? Sure. You know, like I got to constantly exalt myself up here. It's like, what is that about? It's like, you know what, it feels really good sometimes as a man to not have to be the center of attention and not have to be like, you know, the guy that knows everything and has to be right. Sometimes it's cool just to pull back and go like, hey, man, I'm gonna let my son take this one. Like, okay, right. son, why don't you take this one? Like, right. what do you, or, 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 hey, you know what, you know, where's my, do ask my daughter, hey, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? Mm. You know, where do you want to go out tonight? What are you feeling like? It's like honoring people and appreciating them and recognizing like to pull the best out of people. We have to be able to do that. And, and it's so funny too, because people with their marriages, they're always like, you know, um, I'll, I'll work on myself. Okay, fine, fine. Like every man gets to a point in his life where there's so much pain where he's like, all right, fine, I'll work on myself. But what he does is he goes down one of two roads. A lot of times he goes down the road of I'll work on myself so I can learn to love myself, have a healthy relationship with myself and become a better man. Or they go down the path, which is more commonly traveled, which is, all right, I'll work on myself. I'll become a better man if... A, B, and C happens with my marriage or if A, B, and C happens with my wife. Mm -hmm. And they basically attach these rules and expectations, which an expectation is a pre-planned resentment. So they attach this pre-planned resentment, right, to this outcome that they want. So now my personal development process is all about this outcome. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, man, this is about you becoming a better man because of your legacy. And it's about you understanding self-love is self-investment. And that people will benefit and that will pay dividends into other people's lives. Like right. just working on you, you can share a lot of what you you do to work on you with people in your life. It's not about the external. It's mm -hmm. about what goes on internally, you know? Wow. Well, one of the taglines on, on your bios and on your website is uh, reignite your marriage, I think is what it says. And uh, I love that. It's very captivating but it comes down to working on yourself. I mean, because that's all you can really control is, is you and your choices. Yeah. yeah. You'd be really surprised how many guys are in relationships that are abusive and they remain in that relationship. And um, like and their, their, their lady like hits them or shouts at them or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like oh. it's, it's, it's like a totally abusive dynamic and mm -hmm. it goes both ways. But I, I mean, we work with a lot of guys that are in abusive dynamics and it's like they're fighting an uphill battle. And it's like, why are you settling for breadcrumbs inside this relationship, dude? Mm. And, and a lot of these guys, it's like, well, do you even want to be married? You know, like, why are you in a dynamic, you know? And, and the, the sad thing is, like I was saying, it's like, look, do you believe you can bring the worst out of people around you? It's like, well, yeah. Well, what makes you think you can't bring the best out of people around you? You know, you guys didn't get here overnight. Mm. You know, when you got married, you were at a good place. So it's like, you know what? Sometimes, man, we just, you didn't water the garden. You didn't fertilize it. And it, parts of it die. Right. And it doesn't mean that you can't turn it around. But a lot of guys in their marriage, they mm -hmm. try to lead with dominance instead of influence. Ooh, let's talk about that. Dominance instead of influence. Can we dissect that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So dominance is like, you know, establishing these rules, these expectations, trying to lead with coercion or fear mongering or, you know, trying to lead with, you know, uh, what I want to happen and how I want it to be and what needs to happen, what you need to do and how these things need to change. And, 
And it's like, I got to win every argument and I got to, and it's like, bro, that's you, you, you do that. Like, this is not a business. Like you got to lead with influence, you know, like when think about it in, in your, in our lives, you know, like mm -hmm. when we decided to make a change in our lives, was it because somebody like forced us or like coerced mm -hmm. us or like made us do it and held a gun to our head? Yeah, never, <laughs> you know, never it's, yeah. it's because we were inspired. You know, it's because we, 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 we were, we were open-minded and we received from some feedback that shifted our perspective and we kind of went like, oh, wow. Okay. Right. So it's, uh, we can be that influencer inside our family, right. you know, we can lead by example and we can take on and understand that the, the number one way to get people to change is by leading by example is by being the example is by you know demonstrating the change that we want to see so it's about personal standards you know almost every guy that tries to change his marriage a lot of times establishes these rules and it's like okay i'm doing these behaviors but i'm doing them for these reasons and what is the reason well that so my wife will look at me different or that so I'll get this outcome in my marriage so that my wife will want to be intimate with me more. And it's like, no, 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 that's not about that. You know, let's bring a new definition. Wow. It's like, no, no, no. You're doing these things because it's about being a man that you respect. It's about, it's about holding yourself in high regard. Mm -hmm. It's about self-love. It's about self-discipline. It's about, it's about starting the day with a victory. It's about, right. It's about, uh, your physical health. It's about, it's, it's every action is connected to your core values. You know, not every action is connected to an external outcome. Right. It's like, and that's how we operate because in business, it's like, well, everything is external outcomes. Right. Right. It's like, you know, well, well, I need to produce this to create this. And that's just how we think. And so we go into our marriage and we think of it the same way. Right. Like, like, you know, a lot of times as guys, like we, we want to solve the, pro our, our wife shares a perspective and we, we want to solve it with a perspective mm. instead of just listening and validating and understanding that just listening is a solution. We don't ever, we don't ever think that like listening is a solution. I can be, and, and, and here's a crazy part. We want things to change, but we're in this like Mexican standoff. <laughs> Uh, well, you first it's like well if my wife and it's like bro what are you doing like just <laughs> like just do what if you would just model okay so you want your wife to be more like you know loving and, and understanding of you okay are you loving and understanding mm. it's like oh okay i want my wife to respect me do you respect your wife or do you respect yourself right like so how could you establish these rules if you don't even abide by them Right. And it's always like coming from this place of all it's all external, because as men, that's how we live our lives in the external. Right. And we don't we don't focus enough on the internal. And this isn't about like hyper focusing internally, you know, and becoming like, you know, a lot of guys fear like oh, I'm going to become soft and like I'm going to become this like <laughs> all about my feelings. No, no, no. It's the opposite. What you're going to understand is that by not focusing inside, you've actually jeopardized your life, jeopardized your relationships, jeopardized your business, jeopardized your health, jeopardized your, your mental and emotional well-being. And by looking inside, you're understanding and surveying the landscape so that you can operate from a place of total control, right? right? But how could you ever do that if you don't ever look internally, you know? And so I just think it's super important that we're, I think awareness is the key. I think awareness is the cornerstone, man. And, and the only way to master yourself is to know yourself. And the only way to know yourself is to study yourself. So you got to study yourself. You got to know yourself. Yeah, that's, it's, it's so important. But like, as I get older, I realize some of the most important things in life, we weren't taught as kids. We weren't taught. Why aren't we taught about taxes and LLCs and corporations in high school? Right. <laughs> Like, why aren't we? That's a great point, bro. That's so <laughs> powerful because I wonder that all the time. Right. Like, why, why was I 30 before or whatever age I was before I knew the difference between an S corp and a C corp? I was 20. I had credit cards before I, and I was probably like 23 or 24. I had credit cards 
And I didn't know that like, if you just call and say, Hey, I don't want this credit card anymore. It's going to mess up your credit profile for years. <laughs> no idea. Uh, no idea. There's so many things that, you know, we're not taught. And a lot of the guys that we work with, you know, 50, 60 years old, and they're like, dude, how was I never taught this information? Mm. You know, because I'm, we're big believers in education. So it's, how was I never taught any of this? Like, I never knew that, you know, I never knew about amygdala hijacks. Like, and that's why I have these angry outbursts. Like, I never knew about like self defeating belief systems. Like, I never knew about emotional intelligence. Like, I never knew about any of these things. Like, why? How is this like, how, how am I not aware of what's going on here? And opening up that door is so empowering for them because then they realize like, wow, you know, as men, what we want is tools, mm -hmm. right? That's why therapy is, is my opinion, therapy sucks for guys. You sure. know, it's a good first step right, because right. it can be cathartic and we can get some stuff off our chest, which is helpful because a lot of times we don't talk, right. but at the same time, after a while, you get to the point where you're like, all right, so what are we doing here? What are we solving? You're like, got anything for me? You got a strategy for me? You got a tool for me? Right. You got a technique for me? And unfortunately that entire therapeutic model is based on dependency so yes. it's like you going to another person to provide you with something and i'm the believer of you know men can solve anything if you give them the right tools and the right people teach a man to fish he'll fish for a lifetime and you know we, we understand the power of proximity and a lot of guys have never done personal development they've never spent money on a coaching program they've never invested in programs i've invested i've invested well over 100k on programs well over that right uh -huh. and and those programs uh most of which we used you know for business and learning about business sure. were incredibly beneficial and i try to tell guys all the time it's like you would never understand the benefit of doing this work it's like why would you, you know we'll it's so funny we'll spend money on like a boat an rv <laughs> like a new car like a new right. home a vacation but like we'll skimp on our mental and emotional health it's like oh i'll go to i want to go to better help it's like dude why do you want to spend 50 dollars on your don't you understand that the greatest roi you could ever get is working on you on the inside why are you trying to skimp on that like dude go lock in with some people that you connect with that you can get some good results with where you can learn some tools and some strategies that you can actually deploy today to get results and help you turn this around quickly. Right. Right. No, I've gone to therapy multiple times in my life, but there's always a moment where I'm like, wait a second. Are we're really not trying to solve problems here. Cause you want me to keep coming back. Right. I'm not given tools. And, and I have found benefit from, you know, various sessions over the years, but man, <laughs> it's yeah. a racket. It is. And I think that model is going to go away. I really do. I think that I think there's a lot of gatekeeping that happens, mm -hmm. you know, and like I said, working in the industry next to these people for years. Yeah, I always saw almost this like pretentious attitude towards the client of like, well, the client's not capable of understanding. So I'm not going to teach the client what I'm using on him because he's not. And it's like, no, no, no. Yes, he is. If you would just empower this guy and you would spend some time with him and teach him, trust me when I say this, this guy is not dumb. Right. You know, even guys coming off of drugs, it's like the guy's not stupid. Stop treating him like he's dumb. Like stop acting like, and that was, that was what inspired Beyond Driven, which was my frustrations with that clinical world and that setting of this kind of gatekeeping and withholding and not empowering the client and not believing that the client had the solution. And, mm. but yet ironically, you know, they'll sit in a session with you and ask you 47 questions because they're bound by a code of ethics that inhibits their ability to give you advice because it's considered bias. And so they're like, Oh, uh, well, it's like, well, what do you think I should do in my marriage? Well, you know, Tim, it's not about me. You know, what do you think? And it's like, Oh, that's what we're doing here. So we're doing this reflective <laughs> listening shit, right? It's like, well, if I could solve this fucking issue, I wouldn't be in the office. So why are you asking me now? I thought I was, I thought I was going to come and you're going to give me answers. Right. Right. And so, so many guys get lost in therapy. And then what happens is because therapy doesn't work, then they all of a sudden they, they give up and they're like, mm. it's pointless and it's a bunch of hogwash and it's, and it's fairy dust. And I just need to go back to powering through. Right. And um, it is so many men find so much relief when they find 
that they can do the work and make it fit seamlessly into their life and they can make it work and they can realize, wow, you know what? All I needed was tools. And wow, man, I can understand cognitive behavioral therapy now. It makes sense. I know how to use it, right? I understand how to apply some of these communication skills into my life. And wow, that works. And, and, and I understand it. And you know what I'm realizing is that none of it is about creating external outcomes. It's all about creating it's not, it's not the outcome, it's the income, it's what I'm developing inside. And I'm starting to realize, wow, I'm feeling more empowered. I'm feeling more confident. I don't give my power away. I'm feeling more self-assured. I'm more emotionally stable. And that's making me happier. And wow, I'm realizing that I was so close this whole time. And I was just missing a couple things. And that's all I needed. And why didn't anybody teach me that? Kind of like back to what we were saying, right? It's like, why did nobody ever teach me this? Well, you just didn't have the right people or the right tools. And that's not your fault. And I try to tell guys that all the time, man. It's like, it's your responsibility, but it's not your fault, dude. Like mm. you, you didn't know, just like I didn't know, right? All those years that I was addicted, all those years in toxic relationships, all those years. And I became so fascinated early on because I really realized, wow, there's a solution here beyond some, you know, going in a room and identifying as an addict and saying, I have a disease, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that for people that do that, but that just wasn't my path, right. you know? And, and I saw that, you know, this is, Hey man, there's something much more here. That's why we take psychology and fuse it with faith-based principles. It's like, and when you teach somebody something, it's like, everything opens up and they're like, oh, okay, I see it. And it makes sense. And nobody's ever helped me understand it like this. And this be has now given me the ability to solve it very easily because it's not a problem in the external world. It's a problem in my internal world. Mm. And, and that's where you see the greatest moments ever happen. You know, where guys have had sexual abuse from their childhood and they talk about it for the first time. Mm. You know, they've they've felt responsible for someone's death mm. and they get it off their chest. And then what they realize is like all these issues that they had were all connected to internal problems. And that freedom and the liberation that comes with that is what makes them beyond driven. Full you know? circle. I like that. Yeah. That's yeah. what gets them there to the point where they're like, Hey man, what's next? Mm -hmm. And who can I help? And I'm looking around at people and I'm not seeing people who are just assholes and don't know how to act. I'm seeing people in pain. Oh. And I'm looking around at people and I'm going, wow, dude, I'm looking at the world through a totally different lens, man. And I'm looking at this guy at my work and I'm thinking, I used to think this guy was just a jerk. Dude, this guy's hurt. And then all of a sudden, you're like, I, I bet you that guy's hurt. And then all of a sudden, you, you hear his story and you're like, I was right. Mm. And then you start seeing things for what they actually are instead of what they appear to be. Why? Because you did the work on you. And so because you did the work on you, that exchange is so high because you understand if I can go deep inside of me, I understand people on another level because it's all the same. Nothing is new under the sun. We all go through the same things. And as men, when we struggle, we think we are the only guy on the planet going through it. Yeah. I'm the only guy that feels insecure right now. I'm the only guy that feels like he's not good enough. I'm the only guy. It's like, no, you're not, dude. Mm. No, every other guy is going through it. You know what they do? Just cover it up better than you do. Mm. Just not talk about it more than you do. Right. And they're doing the same stuff you were doing to bury it. No, bro. We're all the same. Right. That's powerful, man. That's powerful. And what a what a better way to look at at people, you know, instead of that guy just being a jerk, but you know, instead seeing that seeing the human side of them. Yeah. Wow. What a reality shift. It's fascinating. Uh, so your coaching program, is it one-on-one -on -one group coaching, all the above? How does yeah, that work? all the above. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, we have a platform, we have a training platform and we have a course and we have curriculum and uh, we have tools 
uh, that we teach and empower clients with. They're all our proprietary tools. And then we do group coaching throughout the week. So we spend like five hours a week with our clients. Wow. Um, and then we do the one-on-one -on -one element too. Uh, we also do masterminds and fly-ins and uh, we do some private events and stuff like that too, which are super powerful. Wow. Um, but our main goal is to provide value in whatever way we can, you know, right. is to help people however we can. Right. Even if it's through the free resources that we offer. Um, so yeah, the program is, uh, we're always making improvements. So I'm working on an um, amazing workbook right now that is going to be a part of it. So it's going to be like a a step-by-step -step guide because I have the course, but now I'm going to put like actual physical um, like workbook with it that it will nice. allow somebody to kind of go through the process of back into that self-study, that self-reflection to kind of get to the outcome of understanding, connecting the dots really quickly. That's, that's my goal with all clients is that in real time, you'll be able to connect the dots and that's how we help people change, you know, is, is, what what how can i change my behavior and my immediate impulse or reaction to do something in the moment or change my perspective or learn and understand what's actually happening internally as as a you know as it applies to what's happening externally so it's the coaching it's the groups um and it's the it's the uh curriculum and the uh and the platform and wow. the community of course the community sure. communities yeah. the communities right. You know, when these guys realize they got a safe place to go and they come into the program and, you know, 30 other guys are going, dude, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. They're like, oh, not, nah, this is weird. It's like, yeah, well, welcome. Dude. Glad you're here. And guys are like, this is really weird. Sure. It's a brotherhood. It sounds like. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely, yeah. it has to be because, you know, uh, in order for a place to be a healing place, you got to expose wounds. Yeah, you know, and guys who have never exposed a lot of this stuff, mm. um, they expose it for the first time, and they're met with no judgment, mm. and so there's no shame, right? You know, and they feel safe, and they want that next guy to know, hey, man, this part of me carrying this on, you know, as mm. a part of what I did here and the work I've done is to invite you in and give you permission, and that's what I've always told guys is. By you opening up, you're giving another man permission. You're telling him it's okay. And hey, man, I'll go first. And I already did go first. And I'll go first again. And I'm not afraid to share with you. And then guys go, that's going on with me. And I never told anybody or I'm not comfortable talking about it. And, and I'm learning how to do that. And once we start to open that up is when guys can finally get better. And the sad part is... A lot of times, you know, we're told as men to cover that stuff up further with the bravado and, and, uh, it doesn't work. Sure. You know? Just power <laughs> through, you know, just, uh, stop being weak. You right. know, it's, that's not what this is about. Right. Right. Totally. Yeah. I'll put your links in the, in the show notes, uh, for sure. For anyone who wants to get more information, um, and you celebrated an anniversary last week, I think, according to Instagram, right? It was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That's my awesome. wife and I, my wife and I, uh, it was hard. Like sometimes, you know, how old are your kids? 13, 10 and five. Yeah. So, you know, like when you got, you got young kids, it can be hard to get out, you know, oh, sure, yeah. to watch the sitters. I'm grateful. My folks are still around They're They're in town and, uh, they watch the kids. Uh, so we get, we get support with that. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, man. Yeah. I'm grateful, dude. Kids are awesome. Life is awesome. Um, and I'm just grateful to be here and uh, talking with you and, and helping people. And I hope somebody got some value out of this. Uh, I did for sure. Absolutely. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I know you're a busy man. So yeah. Thank you for your time. And thank you. Um, if I can ever be of service to you in any way, you know how to reach me. Dude, likewise. All right, brother. I'll let you go here. Thanks again, Tim. Right, Appreciate you. Thank you. You got it. See ya.